Hello friends and welcome back to my channel. I'm Lydia, the Halfling Seamstress. And while I refer to myself as a hobbit, I haven't actually done anything on this channel that is particularly hobbity. I've done inspired by elves, I've done inspired by the world of men, but I haven't actually tackled anything inspired by the Shire. Until today. I had some green fabric lying around and I couldn't decide what I wanted it to become and at 11 o'clock at night I was walking around my room and I noticed this lovely notebook I was given in a gift exchange and thought, I have a plan. So for today I'm going to channel my inner Rachel Maxi and make a Hobbit Core meets history bounding bag end inspired walking skirt. Now this being history bounding, I am not going with 100% historical accuracy here, so I'm not drafting out a pattern like I did in my previous walking skirt video. Instead I'm using a modern pattern that has a similar silhouette to a walking skirt and tweaking the pattern just a little bit. So I'm using Quick Sew Pattern K3381 and I've already made two history bounding skirts out of this pattern off camera, so I know it's going to turn out good. But I want this particular skirt to have a little bit more volume. It is a gourd skirt pattern, but it only has three pieces, the front and two side backs. So my sneaky plan is this. I'm going to fold the front pattern piece in half and cut the front width smaller than usual. Then, using the same halved pattern piece, cut out an additional two gores, thus turning a three gore skirt into a five gore skirt and giving me the extra volume I want. The cotton I'm using doesn't have a lot of body on its own, so I'm going to line it with some tarlatan-esque-ish fabric. Okay, I don't actually know what it is, but it looks like tarlatan and it was free. I'm then using those lining pieces to measure out my outer pieces. I also cut out the waistband. Normally it would be lined with interfacing to stiffen it, but I have plans for later, so I'm just cutting out the fabric. And no walking skirt is complete without at least one pocket. I drafted this pattern myself using a tutorial which I will link below. The pattern does not include seam allowance, so I'm cutting approximately one half inch away from the marked seam line. I'm flat lining the outer fabric to the lining, and this time around I'm just pinning it instead of sewing them together. This was part experiment to see how it would handle, and part laziness. Before I start seaming the skirt together, I need to mark out the placket at the back. This goes 10 inches down and will be left open when I seam up the back panels. Then I can start pinning the panels together to sew. I absolutely could not wait one second more to try out my new, to me, antique sewing machine and thought this would be a very fitting first project. One of the challenges of these antique machines is that they don't have a backstitch feature, so you can either plan to tie a knot when you're done, or take a couple stitches forward, turn the fabric around, take a couple stitches in the opposite direction, then turn your project the right way around again. It's also tricky that antique machines don't have the handy seam gauge lines that modern machines do, so I picked a point on my machine and used that as my rough guide to stay on track. Before I stitched up the panels where the pocket would go, I first measured down how far I wanted the pocket to sit. In my case, it's about 7 inches down from the waistband. I then measured the width of the pocket and marked where it would end, so I would know where to start and stop sewing. The pocket pieces get pinned to the right sides of the fabric and sewn along the straight edge. Then the two panels get pinned together, as well as the pocket pieces. The panels are stitched together, and when I reached the pockets, I stitched right around, along the stitch line. One of my favorite things about these old hand-turned machines, apart from how utterly delightful they sound when they sew, is how much more precise control you have over exactly where you stitch. This is particularly handy for curves like pockets. Once the skirt was assembled, I cut out the placket. The placket gets folded in half and attached to the left-hand side of the skirt. The right hand side of the back seam gets turned under and fell down. The excess fabric gets pleated down to match up to my waist measurement, then the waistband is pinned on and stitched down by machine. The waistband is then turned under and fell down by hand. I measured the length of the hem based off another skirt and trimmed it down accordingly to even it out. 
I debated about facing the hem of the skirt to give it more swoosh, but decided I liked it the way it was, so I turned up the hem by an inch and felled it down instead. With the basic skirt complete, it was time to accessorize. I picked up a couple different ribbons to take it from plain skirt to hobbit skirt. I used this green linen style ribbon along all the seam lines for a more textured look. I stitched all the way down one side with little whip stitches, around the bottom, and then all the way back up. There may well be a faster way to have done this, but I tried a couple ways and didn't like it, so I stuck with the method that worked. For the waistband, I wanted to nod to the iron work that holds the wood in place, so I used this lovely grosgrain ribbon by Makuba that I bought off Etsy as a simple accent. I pinned it over top of the waistband, which is why I didn't add interfacing earlier. When it came to the end, I wrapped the ribbon around the overlap tab as well, to reduce bulk. I sewed the ribbon first along the top edge, as this was the most crucial for an even line. Then I went back and stitched the bottom edge down. And since we're adding ribbon, I wasn't going to stop there. I also added a row of the grow grain along the hem, just up from the edge. Just like the waistband, I whip stitched the top edge first, and then the bottom edge. Now here's a lesson in sewing an original design. Sometimes you can have a plan in your head and you're sure it's going to look absolutely awesome, but when you actually go to make it, it doesn't actually look as good as it did inside your head. I picked up this lovely ivy ribbon off Etsy and was planning to stitch it above the grain ribbon at the hem. I got it pinned in place and even started sewing and then I realized I kinda sorta didn't like it. It took the skirt from elegant and could pass just as a normal skirt into cheesy, costumey territory, and I didn't want that. I also didn't like how they had to be stitched in order for it to sit right. If I didn't tack down each and every single leaf, they would have buckled and bent at the first bump or twist of the skirt, instantly making it look less neat. I briefly considered gluing them down, but I really did not want to go that route if I didn't have to. So I ended up scrapping the ribbon all together and just leaving it with the grow grain at the bottom. I guess I'll just have to find another hobby to use for that ribbon now. Maybe a corset. I did have one other little accessory that ended up working out very well indeed though. I wanted something to symbolize the handle of the door, and I found a gorgeous vintage button, again off Etsy, that felt particularly hobbity. For obvious aesthetic reasons, I didn't want to make it right in the middle of the center front of the skirt, so I went a little off kilter and added it just below the waistband at the first front seam. Okay, 
one more little detail that turns this skirt into a bag end skirt. In The Hobbit, Gandalf leaves a mark on the door to show Thorin and company which house to go to. In the movie, it was a rune of G, presumably for Gandalf. In the books, it's actually three symbols, meaning burglar, danger, reward. And Tolkien actually did a drawing of what he pictured the marking to be. So on the very back of the skirt, in an inconspicuous place near the hem, I added those symbols. I wanted them to blend in as much as possible, since they weren't even obvious to Bilbo, so I used a strand of green embroidery floss as close to the skirt color as possible, and for a little bit of something special, I used a thread of glow-in-the-dark floss. Now, it doesn't actually glow that much, but it does look cool under a black light, so there's something. With that final detail in place, it's time for a gentle stroll outside. Since it is well into fall weather and getting kinda chilly, I also brought along one of my favorite history-bounding jackets. 